So let me just let you say that Corey is a professor of political science at Brown University and is also a visiting professor of law at Fordham Law School. And he's um, had other distinguished visiting um, positions, was a Rockefeller faculty fellow at Princeton and uh, other such um, accomplishments. His, he has a, um, a JD from Stanford Law School and MPhil from Cambridge University. And his, he has a lot of books and one in the works, but the most recent published book is The Oath and the Office from W.W. W. Norton. And uh, he's just recently, well, before that, there was one, When the State Speaks, What Should It Say? How Democracies Can Protect Expression and Promote Equality. And the most recent book title is, Corey, coming, that you're working on? Mm, unmute. I'm in the midst of two books. The, the most immediate one will be about the presidency, a follow-up to the oath in the office. It's called The Presidential Test, and it's about the question of how we recover from constitutional crises. So hopefully that will be relevant <laughs> to what's happening. Very essential. And, uh, I'm also working, have been for a long time, and uh, trying to come back to it uh, uh, on democratic punishment, which I'm talking about today. Yes, so um, we're going to hear us um, sort of a shorter version of this fantastic article that appeared in the University of Toronto Law Journal um, called A Democratic Theory of Punishment, the Trop Principle, and we're delighted to host you today. Thank you for coming. Corey. Thanks, Thanks Carol. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, I've had different versions or pieces of the argument and what I'm thinking about now, which I'm hoping all of you will help me with is how to put this into a book. So that's my, my uh, I'm very excited uh, to present this and to talk about it. Um, and uh, I'll speak for about a half hour and then especially look forward to the, to the discussion. Um, let me say something, first of all, about a case before I talk about political theory. And even though I'm gonna talk a little bit about constitutional law, I think of this project as uh, primarily not one in constitutional law, but in political theory and democratic theory specifically. Uh, and the case is Trop versus Dulles. And um, the facts are, are relatively simple. There's uh, a person serving in uh, French Morocco and uh, he's a deserter. He actually leaves uh, for a day and sort of is off base and uh, not where he's supposed to be. And uh, when he returns, uh, the punishment, can everybody hear me okay? Good. Yep. The punishment uh, is that he is stripped of his uh, citizenship. Uh, and um, uh, he goes to apply, uh, the case arises because he goes years later to apply for a passport and uh, is denied. Can you speak on the Eighth Amendment. Uh, his uh, entitlement to not have his citizenship stripped as punishment for a crime, that this is a form of cruel and unusual punishment. And Justice Warren uh, writes an opinion, Trump versus Dulles, that to me, the most important line is citizenship um, uh, is, is uh, not a status that expires upon misbehavior. And my idea here is, as I was saying before, it's a project in constitutional law, not, I'm sorry, in political theory, not in constitutional law, and my ambition, is, though, is to take this case and that kind of principle, the idea that citizenship doesn't expire on, upon misbehavior, and to really use it to build a political theory of punishment, um, not just an account of the limits of punishment, but an account both of why we punish uh, and also uh, the limits on, on punishment. And it's an argument that I'm going to argue is uh, consistent with the principles outlined in cases of constitutional law with the Eighth Amendment and the right way to think about it. Uh, but it's also meant to be a, a theory of both why we punish and, and the limits on punishment. Um, in the paper, I you know, use some more of these quotes from the opinion, but um, one of the important ideas that, that Warren himself is getting from a previous case is that citizenship is not a relationship that can just be cut off or terminated uh, once somebody's been convicted of a crime. It's an ongoing relationship with certain entitlements. And he says something, I think, that sort of has a deep political theory principle. Court opinions are not political theory, but they often in paragraphs or in lines get certain really important ideas out. And he says, the, you know, he cites a broadly an idea of the social contract that citizenship uh, 
um, that, that uh, government is born of its citizens. And so as a result of that principle, we can't just simply cut citizens off when they commit crimes. Um, so uh, uh, that's the sort of foundational idea that I'm trying to, to build from. There are specifically uh, two parts to what I call the CHOP principle or two sub principles. Uh, the first is the idea that I get from this case that uh, if you're subject to law, um, uh, uh, that, that sorry, that the way that we bind ourselves to law is by having a role in making law. Uh, so uh, if you think about the way that lawmaking occurs, uh, we generally think to ourselves, and I'm getting this largely inspired by Rousseau's social contract, uh, we generally, we make a law in general, a uh, law for instance against murder, uh, and then were we to violate that law, uh, we are in a sense bound by it because we've participated in the making of the law. So if we find ourselves to be a, a murderer, Rousseau talks about the assassin uh, in the section of the social contract that's relevant here, uh, then we are bound by that law that we as a citizen uh, participated in making. So our status as citizens uh, both enables the making of legitimate uh, of, of laws fundamental to legitimacy, uh, certainly laws against murder, for instance, there, and we're bound by them as a result of our status as citizens. But the thing that Rousseau is not great on, uh, I largely take that idea from him, but that he's not great on is the limits on punishment. He does say a little bit that, that suggests something about what I'm going to say, but really the case is, is better than Rousseau on this point, that the same principle that justifies uh, punishment in the first place also limits it. And I think that's what Warren is saying, that um, uh, if my citizenship is the thing that gives me, gives the government grounds to uh, punish me, uh, government can't simply alienate the thing that gives it grounds to punish me without losing its own legitimacy. So the limits on government pu punishment are uh, as fundamental here because they are the basis for um, punishment in the first place. Um, so citizenship is at once an uh, enabling principle that enables government to punish uh, and yet also limits those legitimate punishments. Um, so how do you figure out, you know, that's a pretty abstract statement where those punishments are. Uh, the tradition of the Eighth Amendment is kind of all over the place, but I would say if there's one fundamental focus, it's on you know, cruelty and the sort of uh, usual use of that idea of thinking about it in terms of infliction on pain. But what I'm suggesting TROP does is it pulls out this different idea of citizenship that isn't really necessarily about the burden of showing that there's a, a, a infliction of, of pain on the individual. It's rather a stripping of the rights necessary to be constituted as a citizen. And so for me, Trump isn't just any case, it's really the expression of the right understanding, not just of the Eighth Amendment, but also within democratic theory on the rightful limits on punishment in the first place. Um, I'll say something about uh, some of the features, I think, of this theory of punishment as a political theory, and then something too about how you operationalize it within constitutional law and why this is something that I think, if you rightly understand the best tradition of not just the Eighth Amendment jurisprudence, but the constitutional limits on punishment uh, of prisoners. And those include limits both from the Eighth Amendment, but also uh, importantly, the First Amendment. And then they relate also, I'm gonna say something about the famous prisoner exception of the 13th Amendment, uh, and as it relates to the 14th and 15th Amendment. And that exception, of course, is made famous in this uh, great documentary, 13. Um, uh, let me say something about the political theory first. Um, I think that you could, could kind of, one of the main features of what I'm doing, if you think of the framing project, is to say uh, that um, uh, uh, the sort of, uh, the, the theory of punishment has largely found its home in the literature, uh, in ethics, uh, philosophy proper. Uh, and what I'm trying to do is to kind of offer a political theory of punishment, one that links the question of punishment to the social contract generally and the question of legitimate government action. And if you think of retributivism, for instance, uh, it uh, is a theory of desert based on what individuals deserve, abstracted often from uh, 
uh, political considerations or certainly from the apparatus of the social contract. And I'll just give us kind of simple uh, example, um, uh, hypothetical. I mean, imagine, for instance, in discussing the question of whether or not capital punishment is justifiable, uh, that there's a kind of individual who's committed the most heinous crimes and, uh, and kind of lightning strike has occurred. Uh, you might say, well, did that person deserve it? And, you know, I could be convinced that morally they were bad enough that they deserved it. But that's not at all the question that we should be asking when we ask the question of whether or not government should authorize such a punishment as death. Uh, that's one that I think has to be understood from within the social contract. You see a version of that in the famous Mike Dukakis uh, uh, flailing uh, in the debate that he had as running for president when he's asked uh, if he would support, um, if you would think it would be deserved if uh, somebody uh, attacked his wife and, and they were um, given the death penalty. And his answer there, I think, sh should have been, uh, or at least the, the right philosophical answer should have been, um, you know, the right question is not what's deserved, it's what can be authorized by government. Uh, maybe that wouldn't be a great answer in a debate, but that's the philosophical answer, that the question of authorization of state punishment is very different from the question of what's deserved. So I think, you know, the sort of traditional, the classic debate as Feinberg talks about it, sort of abstracted from the apparatus of the state, that, that that's one of the features of what I'm doing, that it really locates the idea within political theory proper. And if you think about it, I mean, political theory, the study of legitimate coercion, if we're going to define it that way, there is no more paradigmatic example of, of supposed legitimate coercion than punishment. That is the state at its most coercive. And so that's why I'm trying to kind of relocate it within um, political theory. Um, the contrast with utilitarianism is probably more obvious. I mean, the, um, you know, certainly utilitarian considerations can be taken in at the margins when it comes, for instance, to years in prison or specific punishments for crime. But the argument that I'm making, the TROP principle suggests that there are certain rights-based limits regardless of whether or not they serve the public good that each individual is entitled to. So um, I think that's the other feature of it, that it, even if it doesn't have the advantage of being able to offer a theory of years in prison, it offers a theory of broadly just uh, uh, kind of outline of what's allowable and then what, what the restrictions on punishment are. Uh, so kind of criticisms of the theory that, you know, that suggest, well, it, it doesn't give a determinative outcome of number of years in prison miss the um, the, what I'm trying to do, which is really to give a, a theory of the outlines here. Um, so how would it work? I mean, I'm, now I am going to return to constitutional law and sort of use the theory in thinking about how to, how to do this. And I, I, I want to um, talk about cases, but not in the sense of like, what has the court said, but in the sense of what should it say about a political uh, theory of punishment. Um, Sorry, I just had I have a 13 year old who I had to ask to be a little more quiet. Um, uh, so moving from the kind of political theory to the um, specifics of constitutional law. Uh, the court in a case called Turner, although it famously protected the rights of prisoners when it came to certain fundamental rights, like the right to get married, also lowered the level of protection for prisoners uh, generally under the First Amendment free speech uh, uh, guarantee and free exercise guarantee uh, uh, when it came to, to, to those other areas, to religion and speech. So in particular in cases, for instance, like about the mail, Turner's been used in a series of cases to say, basically people outside the prison walls have a very high level of protection, strict scrutiny. Government needs to show not only an interest, but a compelling interest. It has to show that the only reason, the only way to achieve that interest is to uh, deny somebody their speech. It's a very high burden on government in order to restrict core First Amendment speech. So for instance, my sending a letter to someone else, um, uh, if government didn't like or was worried about the danger of that letter and it was interfering, uh, almost certainly I would win that case. But inside the prison walls, uh, the court has done something very different. It's lowered the level of protection so that the presumption is that the prison is pursuing a, a legitimate goal is all it has to show, basically security. And there's a theory of um, uh, uh, 
basically prisoner rights in regard to the First Amendment that I refer to as the, the warden knows best theory. And basically it's governed all of the jurisprudence of um, prisoner rights on the grounds that basically prison is a security situation in which wardens are most uh, well situated to determine uh, when security has to be guaranteed, when rights have to be limited. And it, the court has essentially contracted out the protection of the First Amendment to wardens on the ground or to, to, to policymakers in prison. And what that's meant is, as you could guess, basically no rights in the area of um, free speech or religious freedom for, for prisoners under the First Amendment. Now, part of what I'm saying is that when it comes to rights that are fundamental to citizenship, and uh, I wanna say certainly that the First Amendment free speech clause is essential to being a citizen. It's, uh, I'm with Alexander Mickeljohn, the former Brown professor and saying you have to imagine a town meeting as a sort of metaphor and imagine the moderator intervening based on the viewpoint of what people were saying or based on nervousness that it might lead to some kind of danger and restricting the speech. That's a restriction not just on personal expression but on the ability to be a democratic citizen, to hear arguments uh, for or against various uh, ideas, various policies in a way that would deny me the right to be a citizen, to make those arguments, but also to listen to them. So what the warden knows best theory has done is basically eviscerated prisoners' ability to be democratic citizens, to hear the arguments of uh, the day in regard to policy, to democracy, uh, to communicate with the outside world, and also to get information. These uh, information flows are drastically limited in prison because um, of this warden knows best theory. Now, it doesn't have to be that way. It hasn't always been that way. And the best argument for why it doesn't have to be that way is that government has done a really odd thing in regard to religious freedom, uh, in regard to generally religious prisoners' rights. And that's they passed um, a law called the Religious Land Use and Prison Act, usually called RELUPA. And what RELUPA does is it provides a very high level of protection to religious prisoners who can show that the uh, prison warden has adversely affected their religious beliefs in all sorts of areas from uh, meet meetings that might be a mix of religion and politics uh, to a famous case called Holt versus Hobbes that'll sort of illustrate what, why this sort of constitutional inside baseball matters for what I'm saying. Holt versus Hobbes is a prisoner, a Muslim prisoner who wants to grow a half inch beard and he's denied by Arkansas the ability to do that. Now, under the warden knows best theory, you know, the argument that he could hide a blade, for instance, within his beard would simply prevail. We defer to the prison warden. But Ralupa suggests we need to bring back this much higher level of scrutiny of prisoner rights, strict scrutiny in particular. And so what the Supreme Court does, even a conservative Supreme Court does in Holt versus Hobbes, is it asks some basic questions. Did the warden have another way of guaranteeing that um, this uh, that blades wouldn't be you know <laughs> hidden. In, in other words, is there any chance that a, a blade could be hidden in a half inch beard? The court asks uh, the the, um, the litigator arguing on behalf of Arkansas. And the answer, of course, is no. Well, what reason do you have to restrict this beard? Well, the litigator says uh, the prisoner could uh, uh, run outside, shave his beard off, and use that disguise to somehow run out of the prison wall. And the result is basically laughter from the justices who uh, universally say, this security warden knows best argument actually is false. And if we just give it a little bit of scrutiny, we could see that certainly you could preserve this prisoner's right to grow the beard without the demand of security. What the strict scrutiny standard does is it starts to make real the idea that prisoners really do have fundamental constitutional rights that are essential to citizenship, including rights to free speech. So when it comes to religious meetings, uh, if you wanna restrict them within the prison, you have a, have a really good idea. You have to show that it's really, there's no other way to provide security aside from restricting it. And what I'm suggesting is that kind of standard that we do now use in regard to religious prisoners, citizens generally are entitled to, because obviously it's not just religious prisoners that are entitled to special rights, it's citizens more generally. And if Trop is right to say that citizenship is a right that doesn't expire on misbehavior, then the rights of citizenship also have to be guaranteed uh, in that way. And uh, the strict scrutiny standard is sort of a simple way of just saying you know, what that principle is. If you start to use the um, basically idea that government that wants to restrict 
constitutional rights essential to citizenship, uh, um, uh, you, you start to see a different kind of prison emerging because the law will begin to shape what the prison looks like rather than the warden who cares only about security or rather than the state legislature that cares only about security. And the prison would be populated by fundamentally a concern to protect rights. Now, we see places where these rights are protected, including rights of free speech, rights to vote uh, abroad. Um, uh, Michael Moore's film, for instance, profiles some of these prisons that have prison voting. Uh, Maine um, uh, uh, still has uh, prisoner voting. Um, uh, uh, and um, so does Vermont, as Bernie Sanders famously said. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea that these rights can't be guaranteed, I think, is, is somehow uh, gets exactly backwards. The standards of constitutional law should govern uh, what the prison looks like. Uh, you think of Norfolk prison, which is a prison that I'm going to talk about as I get on to the next subject of voting in prison. Uh, uh, and I'm going to talk about the prison constituency that was formed there, but it, I'll tell you something first of all about the history of it. Uh, it's the prison that Malcolm X was uh, held in for a long time. Uh, it's where he was a member of the famous Norfolk Debating Society. Uh, he writes about it extensively. And it's a space, as Malcolm X describes in his autobiography, of civic reflection. Uh, uh, it's where he hones his debating skills. Um, that prison becomes famous in later years uh, for uh, a, a prisoner who I've interviewed and I'm writing about named Joe Labriola. I talk about him in, um, in a couple of the other pieces that I've talked about. What Joe uh, did is he organizes uh, the prisoners of Norfolk prison to make use of their right to vote. Uh, he holds meetings uh, because Norfolk is designed in a way that allows for civic participation. Uh, and um, he gets national attention because he begins to go after the governor uh, uh, and some state legislatures who have been very hostile to, for instance, the rights of elderly prisoners, uh, which he as an activist cares about for a great deal. Now, the end to the story, which we could talk about, is that there's eventually a referendum to strip prisoners in Massachusetts of the right to vote. And it's a result of his activism that they uh, are stripped of it. But I think what it starts to do is to show you that even within the United States, this idea that I'm talking about isn't just a theoretical ideal, but is one that could be, has been realized at least partially. And so that brings me to, to me, the fundamental right. I've talked about rights of free speech, rights of religious freedom, but fundamentally the right to vote is the fundamental right of citizenship that uh, has to be guaranteed, I think, on uh, the theory that I'm offering now. One legal objection to this is while well, the 13th Amendment, um, which of course outlaws chattel slavery, has an exception uh, when it comes to prisoners, I think that is wrong on a number of grounds. And I'll just give you, first of all, on their own terms, the people who are going to bring that argument up most are originalists. Uh, and there was a case rejecting a constitutional right to vote based on largely that exception. And originalism, as many as you know, is the theory that the Constitution should be read in terms of its text as it was originally understood. And it's just thought the plain meaning of that text is that prisoners are uh, excluded from the ban on uh, enslavement uh, and that slavery is consistent with it. The history of the exception is that it's a boilerplate exception that's used in the territories to uh, abolish slavery. And when it comes to the um, vote within the, um, within the United States Congress, uh, the, uh, Charles Sumner uh, realizes he's got to get rid of it because what he wants isn't just an amendment that outlaws slavery in some narrow way. He wants to outlaw subordination, period, and uh, doesn't believe in the idea that, that there is this um, uh, justification for um, uh, basically denying the political status of citizens. He says in a letter that he was on the verge of introducing an amendment to revoke that language, but that basically he was worried that the, uh, that the um, Congress would fail to pass the amendment altogether and that he had the votes at that time and that the antsiness, in particular the desire to get dinner, as he puts it, uh, got in the way. But the right way to understand it, I think, is that the 14th Amendment does amend and clarify that provision and show it to be essentially meaningless within constitutional law, the guarantee of equal protection over law, which, of course, is 
uh, under law, which is um, uh, phrased in terms of no person, in terms of absolutes, that doesn't include uh, an exception for prisoners. So the originalist argument, I think, is just wrong in terms of the history. It's certainly wrong in terms of the evolution of the idea of punishment. I mean, the Trop principle says exactly the opposite. Far from being enslaved people, prisoners under the Trop case are rightly regarded as prisoners. Now that is an argument in political theory, but it's also one in constitutional law. And, and uh, you know, I, I am framing this largely as a talk in political theory, but I do want to make both arguments. I think that case relying on the prisoner exception is, is completely wrong. Um, so what are the arguments for the right to vote as essential to citizenship? And what are the reasons for it? I've given the historical argument. There are also independent epistemic democratic arguments for the right to vote in that prisoners uh, know their own conditions better <laughs> than people outside the prison walls do. And there's a kind of black box when it comes to the treatment of prisoners. And so that epistemic knowledge, I think, is another argument. Um, there is also an argument about abuse. Uh, the idea right now, if you think about it, is who is in charge of ensuring that the um, uh, who is in charge of ensuring that the guarantees of the Eighth Amendment are met when it comes to overcrowding, when it comes to torture by prison guards, when it comes to any of the many plethora of abuses that happen? Uh, normally, we think with Mill that you know individuals are the best defenders and the natural defenders of their own interests. But when it comes to prisoner rights, and we don't deny that they exist under current law, they have the right to citizenship. Uh, in prison, people have rights to free speech, although they're too limited, as I've said. And certainly, you have Eighth Amendment rights not to be tortured. Uh, we rely on lawyers to do that, rather than to allow prisoners to be the natural defenders of their own interests. And so that traditional million argument, I think, also adds to the argument for why citizenship has to be so deeply linked to the right to vote. Uh, of course, what I'm saying is less strange if you're living in Europe right now, because in the Hearst case, um, the, the European Court of Human Rights said a lot of what I'm saying. Um, um, there is a principle of equal protection at play here um, that, uh, you know, I, I think has an intuitive appeal, what the NAACP uh, calls the argument against prison gerrymandering in New York State, for instance. Uh, the NAACP has rightly pointed out that prisoners count when it comes to the census for local rural towns. And yet, even though they count in the census and have been delivering funds to those towns, uh, they have no say in how those funds are spent. And that sort of basic equal protection kind of argument that the NAACP has been pursuing, uh, I think also lends credence to the idea that the right to citizenship demands a right to vote in prison. I talk a little bit in the paper about um, Benjamin Rush, and I'll, I'm gonna mention him. Uh, I think Benjamin Rush, uh, in the book version of this, I'm thinking of beginning with him and his theory of punishment. Uh, he rightly is widely criticized because he invented the idea of solitary confinement. Um, but I think he also, as a theorist, is sort of underrated. Um, uh, and I'll say why certainly he was wrong about solitary confinement as a justifiable idea. But he's concerned to really ask the following question uh, as he meets with Benjamin Franklin and others in Philadelphia at the dawn of the American Republic. They want to know, is it possible to have a, a, a count of punishment that is consistent with the idea of citizenship? Uh, certainly, it can be consistent with the idea of subordination. Kings branded people. They, they tried to make use punishment in order to make it clear that they were monarchs uh, and queens uh, and that subjects were subjects. And so things like branding were used. Uh, the British Bill of Rights bans cruel and unusual punishment to try to limit those abusive punishments that were aimed at showing subordination. In the American context, Rush and others who defended the importation of that British Bill of Rights, the cruel and unusual clause, did it in order to signify an even greater idea that punishment had to be consistent with Republican punishment or punishment, uh, in my terms, consistent with democratic citizenship. That was what they were saying. And Rush took very seriously Rousseau's idea, but he was critical of him on the death penalty 
he was an opponent of slavery and he saw the opposition to slavery as carrying forth into the opposition to uh, certain forms of punishment. Now, how could you design punishment in a way that would be consistent with citizenship for Rush? His first concern was you had to ensure the prison wasn't violent. And the Philadelphia jail, which was what he was trying to reform, was the first thing to not allow because people were being killed in there and that wasn't consistent with punishment. So he comes up with the theory of solitary confinement, um, the first prison in, uh, uh, in uh, Philadelphia, the Eastern State Penitentiary, which you can uh, visit is largely based on his ideas of citizenship. But how would you be a citizenship? He was, he, how would you be a citizen? How would you punish consistent? For him, he, he was a philosopher. So he thought, well, you would provide a space of contemplation like we all like to sit in our you know, favorite room and think about Descartes. And in that room, you would sort of become aware of your, your wrongdoing and then be ready to return to the society. And once you return to the society, uh, you could then uh, re-enter. And this mechanism of solitary confinement would give a kind of space of philosophical contemplation. I think he thought of it as his favorite space that he would write and think in. Uh, we know, of course, empirically that that was a disaster and that what solitary confinement does instead is far from make people citizens, it uh, literally drives them insane. Uh, and I think a way of arguing against it is not to abandon Rush or criticize him the way that many have, and I could talk about those criticisms, but to use the theory and to say, you know, he was just simply wrong empirically about how to carry forth this idea of punishment consistent with the values of the New Republic and, and the Eighth Amendment. Um, so I'm supportive of these cases, but part of the, that show, want to show that solitary is unconstitutional, but one of the problems with them is they're forced into this framework of showing that solitary causes pain, which often it, it stops short of, and instead I want to say it undermines this sort of basic right um, of citizenship. Um, I have a lot of objections that I can talk about, and I'm sure you have some. I'll mention just uh, a few. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you my favorite one. I did have a, um, even though I think of this as a sort of book in political theory, I have a, a version of it that appeared in Politico of all places and that got a lot of attention. So Tucker Carlson has many times invited me to come onto his show to debate him about prisoner voting. And when I wrote this piece in 2016, so when in this past election, Bernie Sanders started talking about it, uh, you know, I became for the right, like somebody who got a lot of <laughs> invitations. Now I didn't, thankfully accept that invitation, but his, I'll tell you what, how he did the, the, the show, and it's a common objection. He says, look, here's Fayetteville prison, I think it was Fayetteville, it was some small town, and the population of the prison is uh, a thousand. The population of the town, it wasn't Fayetteville, it was some small town in the south. The population of the town is 300. If you have prisoner voting, the prisoners will control the town, that would be mayhem. Uh, the reason why I was so irritated to watch him after inviting me on the show do that is the first thing I say in the political piece is, of course, prisoners would vote in their home districts. It would be a way of maintaining their citizenship and connection to their home community. They don't have to vote in the small town in which they're in, and they shouldn't count for purposes of the census within those towns. Uh, so the Tucker Carlson is maybe the most famous one that people bring up, but the easiest to respond to. Um, one really big objections, what about non-citizens? And where do their rights come from and how do they fare on this theory? And uh, I wanna say that the, there is a distinct account of rights that non-citizens I think have when they're being punished by a society that go beyond the rights in many ways that citizens have. So one of the unknown problems of punishment right now is that there are that the, the Department of Justice has a program in which you can request to go uh, to your home country in order to face punishment. And there is a plethora of prisoners currently in American prisons who have put that request out uh, and they haven't been granted that request because it's seen as permissive. But there is a real question on my theory about why at all uh, a country has the ability to punish non-citizens. Uh, and um, so I guess one thing I would say about those cases is there is an entitlement to be transferred home uh, to face punishment in your home country. Uh, hard cases are instances in which people are not from democracies. And I do think that you have a right to be a democratic citizen in some country. And so those puzzles we could talk about, they're much 
much harder. But I would say that there are, are rights that go beyond the rights of citizens for non-citizens. And the other thing I would say is this isn't an exclusive theory of punishment. There are fundamental human rights that um, are distinct from the rights to vote, for instance, the rights of free speech that I'm talking about, but certainly when it comes to rights to be free from cruel and unusual punishment to decent treatment, uh, those don't have to take off from a theory of citizenship. They, I think, can come from independent grounds of human rights. And so I don't want to supplant a theory of human rights. Uh, this is meant to be a further theory of the further rights and distinct rights of democratic citizens. Kids are not democratic citizens. How do we justify punishment of children below the age of 18, their future citizens? Uh, and I think you can't. I don't believe in punishment as a category that's appropriate for children. Uh, I think that um, you know there are certain needs of children that have to be met. Uh, uh, there might in some cases be arguments for um, uh, facilities that constrain children, um, but they can't be regarded as prisons and shouldn't be looked at within a theory of punishment because uh, that's not the right way to see children. The right way to see children are as people who are entitled to an education and to the extent that they are committing violent acts, it's that they have um, usually, in most cases, uh, been abused uh, or been mistreated by the state and government still has an obligation to them. So the fact that the theory doesn't apply to children, that it doesn't get off the ground or justify punishment of children, I see that as a feature, not a, not a bug. Uh, so those are a few objections. Uh, there are many more, of course. And um, uh, Carol, if that's good for you, I, I'm happy that's to- That's fine, so that's sure. great. Thank you very much. I guess we'll hold our applause till the end. Okay. Uh, uh, so we're moving now to Milo's comments, hopefully uh, reasonably short because we had such a late beginning. Milo, you there? Yes, I'll, okay. um, I'm just gonna read something. I'll try to cut down because yeah. for the workshop, we normally have extensive comments. And so I have, I have, I had prepared about 15 minutes of comments. I'll try to cut it down uh, a bit. Especially uh, because of that initial. Yeah, because of the bombardment. Mm. Um, okay, so uh, I just wanted to emphasize, you know, uh, how thankful we are to Professor Brett Schneider for bringing this very interesting paper um, to us. And it's a really important topic, uh, especially right now, obviously, the question of uh, and, uh, suffrage for you know, millions of people. And if we're also thinking about those who have been formerly incarcerated, having their, I mean, uh, excluding suffrage uh, to the incarcerated extends to the form formerly incarcerated. So the, these, these problems are joined. Um, just here in New York, uh, Jaleel Montekim, who is a BLA member who had just been released after 50 years in prison, uh, was almost, well, was nearly arrested and is being uh, uh, prosecuted by the assistant DA for registering to vote in New York. And this, he just was released after 50 years in October. And then this week he's being prosecuted. So it is a major issue. You know, this is not a, yeah, this is a very, um, especially in the prison reform world. Um, okay, so uh, Dr. Brett Schneider does not make the case for enfranchisement of incarcerated people as a moral or on moral humanitarian grounds, nor is the aim, as I understand it, explicitly aligned with growing decarceral efforts. What it does do is reframe the US prison system as a political problem that needs to be re reconsidered on political grounds, specifically in terms of democratic rights. Um, I won't go over too much the legal case, the legal argument that he has made, because he has just done that for us, and I think very clearly, um, by uh, uh, the the Trop v. Dole's uh, Warren argument, where, from which he develops this political theoretical account, um, is uh, uh, argues basically that the pr principles of U.S. democratic constitutionalism show that sir, liberties can be revoked, liberties can be uh, 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 can be constrained, but basic demo democratic rights cannot. And that the uh, rights of co-rule, the right to vote, the right of association, the right of speech specifically, should be re-extended 
to those whose liberties are being curtailed. And in fact, that in order to curtail any liberties in a democratic uh, system, the logic that would allow that curtailment must, on the other hand, preserve the democratic uh, democratic rights. So uh, in the Trops case, he gives the ground for legitimate democratic punishment. The rationale of democratic punishment is that when citizens make their own laws, those laws are legitimate as are punishments that are made for violating them, which violators as citizens should, and I quote, appreciate when they think about in the, the law in general, not just their, um, appreciate when they think about the law in general, not just their particular circumstance. Therefore, two things are accomplished. One, punishment is made legitimate under a democratic rationale, and the basic for, basis for accepting one's punishment is also made legitimate under the condition that one is a democratic citizen who shares in the benefits of this compact, including the provisions for safety that they are generally sharing in when they specifically have been removed from society. <clears throat> And I'm going to skip some of these arguments that he just went over. Um, if the vote is to be extended, the means for particip participatory effort of self-role needs to as well. So that means that the prison needs to be redesigned in order to allow means of assembly, communication, access to information, and everything that would be necessary to accommodate civic engagement by incarcerated communities and indiv individuals. Um, the argument for strict scrutiny, I'll just re resubmit that point, seems to be the means by which Professor Brett Schneider sees this being accomplished, and um, which would put the burden of you know, narrowly tailored arguments for stripping someone of their rights upon those who strip it to make that case, which makes it much harder to deny rights than the very uh, Byzantine system that docks, for example, in New York has for all sorts of strange and uh, uh, sort of prison to prison uh, codes that uh, you know have all sorts of visitation rights, communication uh, structure, all these sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> and so in terms of uh, Brett Schneider's uh, democratic rationale to punishment undercuts a number of certain other leading theories for incarceration, like retributivism theory, where each should get their uh, due or deterrence, which both, he argues, miss the political point that incarceration in a democratic society isn't a moral system, but one of politically constituted penalties, which are self-fashioned to be limited. One of those limitations is that citizen citizenship is not a moral right but a political one and that there are no boundaries to citizenship based on moral character. I think these are very strongly argued in the paper. Um, uh, Brett Schneider also crit uh, critiques restorative justice, which evacuates the role of the state, the relationship of the state, and abolition, which he notes would create anarchy or is more aligned, you see anarchy if the capacity to restrict liberty is, is, is removed. Um, to summarize this part of the paper, uh, tr the first half, Trop, Trop gives a means to justify incarceration and limits incarceration to individual personal loss of liberty, while, while the incarcerated retain their general democratic rights as citizens. Um, here we see the reemergence of a modern duality between the citizen and the private individual, one subject to, to coercion, the other free of it, or rather to free to have a hand in it. Here, the legitimation for punishment is, is uh, that one can only be punished by rules one has a say in. And I and noted the, the Rousseauian sort of un tones here, but you actually went into great detail on this, so I won't, I won't talk about this. Um, in the second part of the paper, Bretschneider makes an instrumental political case for extending suffrage um, and argues basically for a constituent theory of democracy. Uh, whereby uh, to make uh, the prison institution like other democratic institution, it needs to be shaped by the experience of those who are the object of it. And, <clears throat> uh, and so this would allow everything from uh, pressure on prosecutors, 
to uh, wardens, to uh, individual, you know, to in general, the whole slew of ex the experience of prison would have uh, more of a of a democratic outlet for reform. Um, and so it's part of this question of the legal aspects of the constitutional uh, of, of this of this uh, this effort to make the prison align with uh, democratic ideals also needs this political avenue. So even to use these legal means like strict scrutiny, you need a constituency that can uh, fend for itself in the political system. Um, okay, so I'll stop here and ask a few questions. Uh, so first, I it, and this was only a passing one, but um, <clears throat> first abolitionists often talk about non-reformist reforms, meaning reforms aimed at decarcerating at building the capacities for alternatives to mass incarceration, for building community power and self-determination to opposing system, uh, systematic forms of deprivation and related forms of domination and coercion that enforce those means of exploitation. I, I was wondering if you could help explain further why you are not a prison abolitionist in this argument. And I, and I don't understand abolition as being an abstract argument against coercion but a materialist critique of the way in which the abstract right to coerce becomes the basis for building vast infrastructures for reinforcing material exploitation. Meaning that in order to abolish prisons, the conditions that produce them politically and economically have to be overcome. And I certainly believe enfranchisement would be understood by abolitionists as non-reformist reform, unless the case for enfranchisement became more of one more way for the legitimations of prisons without providing the means to actually start to empower incarcerated peoples and communities from when, where they come from, which brings me to the second issue that I'm thinking of. <clears throat> Poor communities typically have a lot of trouble transforming themselves into powerful constituencies, political constituencies using voting blocks. Flint's water is still very dangerous, for example. Um, if the Bronx is still a highly policed and has a high rate of incarceration, if the prosecutorial styles haven't been corrected through the ballot box, why should we imagine that voting will change that and not just provide a new sort of theoretical legitimation for incarceration? And that actually, I'm really interested in the, the, the sort of debate that you brought up in the end where between incarcer um, where that constituency will be based, whether it will be in the home neighborhood of incarcerated people or in the neighborhood or in the uh, counties where they are incarcerated. And New York's a perfect example, upstate prisons. Most people are coming from, you know, the Bronx uh, Brooklyn, uh, you know, parts, uh, big cities in uh, North, uh, North New York. Um, and, uh, and the question, and this is also a huge issue uh, connecting to the, the means for voting in terms of communication and connections with that, com those communities, because obviously it's really hard, JPay, all the ways in which to try to communicate with your family members to have visits, this whole system of bringing people to uh, rural counties is also makes it impossible for it really difficult for connections to the community to continue. So this, I see what you're saying as a way to continue to reinforce those connections to find ways to reinforce, but without actually moving people back. This is not a case for prisons within uh, having to remain in the communities from which they come. This is not an argument saying that people must be imprisoned in the communities from which they come in order to stay connected to those communities. It's that the prisons have to facilitate the means for people, they're, they're incarcerated to retain those connections to their communities, wherever those communities are. But might the opposite be almost more politically salient in, in Tucker's nightmares? because it would mean that those rural counties that benefit from these populations would now have to be at the ballot box with them, that guards and, and guards and incarcerated persons 
would be voting for the same on the on the same uh, voting in the same um, uh, uh, elections, and that it would tie prisons to the local communities. It would make them members of that community rather than just in their custody of those communities. So those that's that. I mean, those are just some quick questions. I'm sure. There, I mean, it's a very very interesting. Um, Argument, and I, I would love to get more into the the political art. This as a political argument, and um, Russia's st stuff. So, but I'll stop. I'll stop then. I'll stop there. I'm sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Corey. Did you want to very briefly touch on a few? Yeah, things? yeah. Um, but My quick, so send me the rest of those remarks. I mean, you're really a commentator in the best tradition of thinking with the paper and extending it. And um, as you'll see when I answer you, I've been thinking about those issues. Uh, the first one I've been thinking about a lot. The second one actually I haven't been thinking about. And so I'm, I'm particularly grateful for that. Um, on abolition, um, I think I will engage in the book version much more than I do here, partly because that's how I started thinking about it. When I was in law school, that's when Angela Davis started giving her talks about prison abolition. I went to one and it was terrific, but I was struck by something. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I think that you know, when she was really pushed about the question of whether or not she thinks the government can have criminal law uh, in regard to the most violent crimes, her answer is yes. And so once you acknowledge that, I think you need to do something like what I'm doing. And I think as much as the rhetoric of prison abolition sometimes suggests otherwise, if it's not anarchism, you know, in the philosophical sense or in you know, more than the philosophical sense in the sense of not believing in the criminal law or that it's not necessary. I think, you know, if you have laws against murder, you need a theory of punishment. Um, now, you know, you could say this is a theory of coercion. Well, okay, fine, you could call it that. <laughs> I mean, that's what I mean, a theory of forcing people to be confined against their will when they commit crime. So I don't think that the abolitionist really does, and I'll start with Davis as the most famous, uh, not have a theory of punishment. I think that it's often hidden and not something that they want to talk about. They want to talk about radical changes to the prison system, but I think implicit in what they're saying is always coercion. Even take uh, you know, a lot of programs in restorative justice, which I fully support. If you don't, there has to be a but. You know, if you refuse to participate, there is a deeper threat there, and the threat is usually of some kind of confinement. Uh, but I think at the same time, you're right to talk, point to, so that's my criticism of, of that language of abolition. I think it hides the need for a theory like what I'm saying. Um, out of a concern too, I think often a sort of Marxist concern that this is an ideological threat of extending the carceral state more broadly. Now, my response to that is look at what I'm saying. And what I'm saying is very close to what a lot of quote unquote, prison abolitionists are saying the right to vote, to be a citizen, to free speech. But what I'm, and the, you know, the need for uh, decarceration of ending a lot of the crimes that are crimes. I mean, certainly I don't think that uh, the criminal law should ban um, uh, possession of marijuana to take the easiest. But in the end, we are talking about, um, you know, there is violent crime in the United States of the most serious Kind. And when it comes to that, I do believe in some form of confinement. Now, in Europe, you know, in the Scandinavian countries, for instance, that I pointed to, uh, they have prisons. They don't look like ours, but they are, that is not prison abolition. It's, it's a radical form of prison reform. And so I think that's the language that, that I'm more comfortable with because I precisely want to have a theory of justifiable confinement punishment and do think that the social contract can offer that now. When it looks, you look at what I'm doing. I think it's probably right that it looks pretty similar, and maybe goes beyond what a lot of prison abolitionists are saying. As I said on that other point about, you know, that was great. I think I might have used that about the sort of, you know, the constituency is partly internal, um, and there's a kind of sense in which prisoners, as natural defenders of their own rights, but they also have natural allies. Uh, their families, uh, the most obvious ones. And that's why these, I was stressing in the beginning, sort of the right to communicate as being so fundamental. And that is deeply connected to who the constituency is. And I talk about constituencies because one of the problems with theories of democracy is often they talk about the individual. That's not how people vote. They vote in blocks. 
And so the possibility of a prison constituency with the natural allies that they have who are defending prisoner rights already, you know, families made mostly of the families of prisoners and others who, you know, for reasons of justice care about these issues, the uh, reenfranchisement of um, post felony disenfranchisement, that huge successful movement to restore rights there uh, is another natural place to look for this constituency. Um, so yeah, I, I think that was really helpful. If you have written versions or even just notes, I'd love to see that. And I would love to see what you say about Rush. It is another thing I'll say about Rush. I mean, that is a big difference between me and the prison abolition movement. I think they want to paint Rush as a bad guy and I'm kind of reviving him as, no, he really isn't a bad guy. He's trying to do what um, people call themselves prison abolitionists want to do, which is to restore uh, those who are guilty of violent crimes to the social contract. Now, he did not have the advantage of modern knowledge of, um, he was wrong empirically. Is that something we can morally fault him for? I think he just didn't know what he was doing. And now we do when it comes to specifically to solitary confinement. Yeah, Milo, would you like to um, sort of have any follow-ups there or anything before we go on to uh, questions from people generally? Yeah, I guess just one quick one, just one quick, because I think my 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 uh, little intervention here is that I and as you said, I think that I see this as something that you know people in the sort of abolitionists in the uh, vein of Ruth Wilson Gilmore would call reform, you know, non-reformist reform. The 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 political prob the political question though isn't about whether or not. Co coercion or co um, confinement abstractly is wrong. It's about how it is done in, it is it is how it is done in as a sort of solution to po like sort of mass impoverishment and these sorts of things. Yeah. And that without, without actually changing the conditions of that sort of mass impoverishment, that uh, an argument for making incarceration more, um, uh, uh, more compat or more acceptable in sort of in, in, as a as a vision of society, without actually changing. Like you know, if voting isn't uh, successful in changing sort of a car the carceral movement in the U.S. the the carceral tide. If that doesn't make, become more successful, then will it just retain as the argument, as the philosophy behind it, as these other, you know, as as, the, as these other ones? That's that's the question. I I'd say two things. One is that's not prison abolition. I think they're just wrong to talk that way. Uh, that's not what it is. It is the defense of a reformed idea of the pre uh, prison, and so the idea that you're abolishing the prison. In fact, it's it's more the original. The uh, prison comes from Rush. That's the original idea. That's what he's talking about. In some ways, it is the original idea of the prison that's gone wrong. And so to say you're an abolitionist, or you know, I think just misstates what they're often doing. But the point I think is a good one about the need to, and certainly I agree with that. You need to have a theory of punishment that also has alongside it a theory of distributive justice and. If you don't solve poverty, which is the result of a lot of crime, then you haven't really gotten at the crime. Now, the problem is, what do you do with the most violent crimes? Do you not punish them as there's uh, mass poverty because we have, you have to deal with that first? I don't think that's a, a real solution. I think we have to actually answer the question. And I think the other thing is, how do you achieve the reforms that we're talking about? That's part of my other possible quarrel if they were to object to my granting the vote now. I mean, I could imagine somebody saying, if you grant the vote now, you reinforce the system, you sort of legitimize it, that kind of Marxist. I have a colleague, Alex Gorovich, who is a, a real orthodox Marxist, and that's the kind of thing that he says, uh, as he self-identifies at least. And, you know, to me, the idea of the constituency is the means, too, of how you move towards that world, because it, it gives a real mechanism for people to both trying to light on the horrors of their own confinement right now and a political constituency to change it that doesn't exist now. I mean, 2.5 million people are in prison. It's an enormous constituency. If um, uh, New York were to grant the right to vote, it would change our politics and we put this on the agenda. Uh, so much of politics is agenda setting and having a constituency allows you to do that. Now, 
you know, that happened in the Norfolk example, and yet it was defeated by a backlash. So that, you know, that is a risk, but I think it, it is a sort of both principled and practical argument. Okay. These are great, really great exchange, great thoughts. Very interesting. Let, let's open it now to other people. I see that there were some that wanted to ask questions. So, um, uh, and if you all raise your hand, use the raise hand function. Yeah, I'll call. keep track of it. I'll, I'll call on people. So, uh, who was it? Someone said it was a Tyler. It was Tyler. Yeah, please. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks for thanks for sharing your essay. Um, I was wondering, I mean, this, this, although the trap ruling uh, seems to imply that citizenship is the basis uh, for punishment, it seems to me that's not the most accurate way to think about what is the basis of punishment. As you mentioned, you know, non-citizens get punished all the time, as was made all too clear with the situation on the border with Trump's rules separating families. Um, and so I was, I was wondering if you've thought about like the general police powers of the state to regulate the health morality, establish the border and general welfare of the society as the basis. It seems to me that maybe a different way to think about it, in a slightly different theoretical frame to look at this situation, which might line up with Milo's comment that the individual is, is divided between the private individual who's subject to coercion and the citizen or the political individual who has these certain rights, might be to see the police power of the state as the basis for punishing and the political rights protected in the Bill of Rights as a limitation on that power. Um, so, and I take it these protections would also extend to the non-citizen because of course, you know, the First Amendment, for instance, doesn't mention citizenship. It just sort of talks in general terms. Um, so I'm wondering if you've thought about how the state police power might fit into your theory of democratic punishment. Well, in constitutional terms, you know, the power of the police power of the states, this general power to regulate health, safety, and morals after the 14th Amendment is limited. It's limited by the Bill of Rights. So I think there's a way of just reusing that language in my terms. Now, the police power itself, and this is something that I think is missed in, in modern constitutional law, uh, has to be authorized. And the Bill of Rights is not a totally separate idea from the police power. And actually, this was, it's, you know, there were kind of three constituencies in Philadelphia. There's um, the Hamiltonians who are really pushing for, you know, famously pretty broad national power, almost a national police power. Um, there are the um, uh, uh, Southerners who are pushing for a Bill of Rights, Virginians. And then there's this middle constituency, the, the Pennsylvanians, and Rush is not mistakenly a Pennsylvanian. And they, what they're stressing is all power has to be authorized. And even when we're talking about the power of either, either the federal government, but I'd apply this to the states too, there has to be a democratic authorization of that power. And absent that, it can't act. So there is no plenary or absolute police power to punish. Even from the beginning, that power has to be grounded in a democratic theory. And not only limited by the Bill of Rights, but in a way, I think what I'm doing both talks, you know, uses the modern language of the Bill of Rights, but it also has that middle position that it's, it's rectifying the, the Pennsylvania idea that, that only power which is democratically authorized can be granted to any level of government. Uh, Aaron has a question. If anybody else does, please use the raise hand function. Aaron, next. Hi, uh, thanks so much. Um, so I'm going to go out on a limb um, and ask a con law question. Sure. Political, I'm a political theory student and I'm admittedly a bit of a dilettante when it comes to the con law side of things. But I have a student, actually, Carol, from your uh, PhD program who's a student at Fordham. Is he here, actually? Oh, Josh, no. Uh, unfortunately, I think he had, he's in Texas helping his family out. There were some okay. COVID cases. Oh, sorry. Okay, Aaron, sorry. I'm no, very, no. Okay, yes. No worries. Um, I guess I was reading your piece. I, uh, something popped into my head, which is the, the animus doctrine and um, whether or not that's something you've considered. Perhaps it would just be too, too crazy or would be stretching a constitutional principle way too far, but the notion that that the that to pass any sort of law that suggested a desire to harm a politically unpopular group, keyword politically unpopular, since it seems like as Milo mentioned, as you mentioned, the part of the project here is to separate the the ethical um, the ethical intuition that drives people's relationship to incarceration from the from the 
Well, you do it as an equal protection argument and it would go like this. You would say, look, there are these sort of categories that get you heightened scrutiny, like being um, a, um, like being, a, um, you know, discrimination with a category based on gender or based on race. But even on rational basis review, if you're showing animus to a group, uh, that's the case in gay rights, that's how the jurisprudence gets going, that if you're showing animus or hatred uh, to somebody based on sexual orientation, then that's banned by law too, even if it's not a protected category. And your thought is there might be some intentional discrimination against prisoners depriving them of basic rights that is- animal. Once they're incarcerated. So it would also be a way of- It's interesting. Of, of saying, you know, because if, if the part of the spirit of this article is, you know, incarceration is enough. Merely putting somebody in a box, no matter how big, no matter how nice it looks inside, is enough. That's a punishment. To then stop from that point and say everything that comes after yeah. looks like an attempt to harm a politically unpopular group because you yeah. really don't want to harm. I like that idea. I mean, I guess what I'd say in thinking about it, and I'll think about it more, but is that it's too weak for what I want to do. I mean, what I want is to get that higher level of protection in which the rights right. are presumed, and then government needs to show a justification. Because if it's just rational basis review and you have to show, okay, this isn't about animus, all government needs to do is say, oh, this is about security. And that's the word knows the best theory. And so I think the animus claim is too weak for what I want. I need to have that higher level of protection. So how do I get it? I get it you know, through these specific democratic rights, the fundamental right to vote, the um, right to free speech and the right to free exercise. I guess I was I also-, also I also think you're right, I should say, and there might be, there are some cases that aren't captured by those specific rights where there is a kind of animus argument. Uh, and that, you know, that, that might be- um, Or if you're compromising with a conservative court. I mean, yeah. that is also the story- Yeah, of the right, as a sort of- A way yeah, of not having to commit all legal protection, but still effectively doing what- Yeah, it is. I have to think, of, I do see that. And you're technically right. It is a, a, te a easier thing to show animus often than to show that there's a protected category. And that's true of the history of gay rights, that that was sort of the way in. I think with this court, you know, the reason why my, this practically my strategy might work better is that there is a de hugely developed, strong theory of First Amendment free speech protection that this conservative court likes and of religious freedom, right? I mean, that's their thing. And so the more you could kind of glom on to those religious freedom cases, uh, you can do it that way. There also is a somewhat developed jurisprudence of the Eighth Amendment, including Trump itself, which is not animus, but is a specific protection of prisoners. And so drawing out that helps. Um, but, you know, m the more the better. <laughs> I think certainly what you're saying, although it's not as ambitious as I want to be, it, it, could, it is helpful. I want to jump in with a couple of questions for you, Corey. Yeah. Um, first of all, it's very impressive effort uh, to use um, a kind of Arendtian, but also a contractualist justificatory strategy that emphasizes democratic citizenship. But as you yourself acknowledge, it does have this problem of not applying to non-citizens. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted a couple of questions just to push that a little bit further. Uh, first of all, I was curious whether your you uh, whether the actual decision involved your conception in some sense of democratic citizenship. You didn't discuss that in the paper, so uh, I was just kind of curious about that. But are you trying to suggest that uh, that it requires a commitment to your particular theory of democratic citizenship, um, kind of uh, because? It is kind of a narrow one that is contractualist and what people would agree to and so forth. I'm wondering if you have to require that. Um, and um, there is this problem of the applic application to uh, of outsiders. So one other option would be to talk about the members of a society rather than focusing only on citizens, yeah. which is rather pernicious anyway for, from a number of other perspectives, including the, tr the treatment of immigrants or migrants, um, obviously, in other contexts. And wouldn't it be the case that they are also subject to the laws? So in that sense, uh, they also would be uh, able, or you could argue they ought to have some say in the, you know, some ways of preserving their democratic input, if not fully voting. 
Yeah. Um, but so that, but the other thing that I would personally favor is a little bit more distant, which would be a human rights justification, counting the right to vote as a human right. Mm. And it would be a more cosmopolitan approach that would be de delimited to, um, by pr for practical reasons to the members and citizens of a particular po a territory but it would yeah. be based in human rights. So you've got this kind of grab bag. You've got some human rights basis for the non-citizens, and then you've got the democratic citizenship as a core. Mm. But uh, I just think that it, that from a human right, you could get most of the rights that you're interested in protecting as human rights and then delimit it more. That's not your justification, but that would be one I would be inclined yeah. to. I mean, I guess I was thinking about the, I mean, I've been thinking about this and this is, I think the part that I need to do the most work on is how this, how the treatment of non-citizens. And I think I can help myself to a lot of what you said. The first is I do think there is a human right to be a democratic citizen. So um, in some cases, you know, there, there are different kinds of cases. If I'm a traveler from England and I come to New York for a day and I murder someone, my rights are, and needs are different than somebody who is from uh, you know, lived here their whole life, um, a dreamer, for instance. And I think what the right to citizenship, democratic citizenship does is, you know, you have a right to be a citizen of some democracy. And so in the British case, I'm, I don't see the need to grant citizenship to that. No, but you have to have a justification of punishment of them also. Yeah. And that's right. because they're yeah. a member, at least for the time being, or a resident or something. But I think they have, you know, I think both there is I think there's a limited justification in the sense that they have a right to go home. I mean, that's that's the thing that I want to say that that's cap that's the additional right that's captured by this theory. So if they want to be punished in England, I think there is a sort of puzzle as to why we can punish them in the United States. Now they have other at the same time other rights in the English case. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, Carol, why don't you mute? Yep. Okay, I'm ah, back. Okay. I, I guess so that's, that, so, you know, in some cases I would say you have a right to be a citizen full stop and that's the dreamer case. Now, what do we do? I guess I'm interested in what you, how you would think about it. Like, what do you do in the case of the British citizen of England who travels to the United States and commits a crime I mean, it seems to me they don't have an entitlement to, to vote in our elections and that they yeah. don't have the full rights of citizenship. And they might have some rights that are distinctly related to their status as British citizens, like the right to be punished in their home jurisdiction if they want to be transferred or even tried in their home jurisdiction. Well, but what would be your justification for punishing them here at all then? Yeah. Because um, they're not citizens. Yeah, I think that there, there's a limited justification. I mean, that's the, that, I'm not sure there is one. I think that there's well, what treaties. Would be the justification for detaining them? It would just be to protect treaty them. Treaty law, well? basically. It's that through the the Brit the way I think about it, and I'm puzzling through this, but the way I I'm running it now, is that you exert your democratic will through England, which then makes treaties around the world, and those treaties might be you know you might be exercising your will through treaties that have extradition or you know no extradition, but it's a separate sort of puzzle in the case of in that case where you really are from another country and I think that's consistent with it's not totally at odds with the way the prison system works that there are these mechanisms of relief that you get through representation through your embassy and you know right to um, you know what should be in my view a right to be transferred not not just request that you be transferred home to face punishment there and it really is up to the sovereign entity to which you belong to punish you, not to, not to the United States. For doing something elsewhere? I think so. Yeah, that's the argument. So, I mean, it's not a otherwise you, you know, think of like people from the United States who travel abroad. It works the other way too, like people who travel abroad and commit crimes. Even if they haven't committed crimes in those jurisdictions, they might be subject to our to U.S. But law. How does it fit with your theory of the, yeah. the justification is that it's because you have somehow, you know, are participate in making the laws, uh, and they don't. Yeah, so it, 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 it suggests a real, a real limit on the ability to punish non-citizens. That, that's part of what I'm conceding, that there is a puzzle there. I don't take it for granted that, you know, it's obvious that we have the right to, 
punish however we want the non-citizen. It might, I mean, the other way to do it is that there, you know, there's a separate rationale of self-defense sometimes that if your home jurisdiction isn't going to punish you and you're, you know, committing crimes, it might not be within the theory. It might be some totally separate rationale that looks more like self-defense. Okay. And you know, some people want to say all punishment is like that. And that's my argument that no, it's not that that that's a unique kind of thing that goes on there. So, you know, in the instance where England isn't going to punish you and, you know, you can't both have the deterrent and protection effect, then, okay, government might need to, to punish you, but not for the, there, it's, it's out, it is, as you say, outside the theory. And just, a, could you comment yeah. on the degree to which they have to be committed to your contractualist understanding of democratic citizenship? Yeah, I mean, I think that's why the fit with constant, I, I guess I partly what I want to do is con defend contract contractualism of a certain kind. And to say that it isn't just some abstract theory that there's a fit with the way, I mean, that was the sort of benefit of those exchanges about constitutional law. And one way I'm thinking about doing the book.